sit back and get ready to take off with Dynamic Golf. Sir, are you are you guys ready? I'm ready to go. Yeah. So, all right, welcome listeners. Welcome to Dynamic Golf Podcast. I'm your co-host Tim McElvana. With me is my fellow co-host Sean Sean Klotz. And today, Sean, please let us know what is our guest for today. Uh, this one's about 40 years in the making, T Mac, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. But uh, we, you know, some of the listeners know that I've moved up here to Oakley Country Club in Watertown, Mass, uh, from Peabody, Mass uh, originally. And uh, my boss, my uh, head professional at Oakley Country Club is Scott Johnson, and we're just excited to have him. So, Scott, just introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners and kind of tell them who you are a little bit and where you came from. No Thank pressure. You. No pressure. Yes. No pressure. My name's Scott Johnson. I've been at Oakley Country Club for the last 25 years. been in the golf industry for, oh, 36 years now. Uh, six other clubs prior to coming to Oakley in 1999. Uh, grew up playing golf my whole life, learned from a brother uh, who allowed me to play when we first snuck onto a golf course and uh, got the bug when I was 13 years old and have had it ever since. I eat golf, I sleep golf, I dream about playing better golf. I do. I'm a golf addict for sure. Wow. Wow. And yeah. you've been a PGA pro since uh, 94. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Very so good. he snuck up golf courses like me and you used to, too. It's just so, you know, we were talking beforehand because we work together every day, but then I'm like, you know, just kind of prepping them a little bit for what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. It's so funny, like, how we all kind of come from that same little background of, like, my brother's five years older, my brother's the same age and uh, class as Scott. So they went to Peabody High School together and they went to University of Tampa. My brother came back after a year, but uh, that's how I've known Scott since I was 12. But I would always tag along with my brother mm -hmm. you know with balls in the backyard or you know going down to the local golf course cutting through the fence that we're not supposed yeah. to be and scott was telling the same story with his brother uh, it was wow. it was funny growing up uh we when i my brother's 10 years older than i was so all his buddies were playing golf and he was he was babysitting quote unquote me so he would drag me to the golf course and i would i would either carry the bag or put it on a push cart and carry it. And that was at a public golf course in Salem, Mass, called Salem Muni. So okay. I would sneak on there. Then as I got older, I lived near Salem Country Club, which is the top 100 in the United States. We would ride our bikes up uh, with our bags on our back, we'd ditch our bikes in the woods, and then we'd sneak on to Salem and play number 7, 8, uh, 16. We'd skip around and play a few holes and just, you know, doing everything that kids do. <laughs> Uh, and that, that's where I learned the game. Then I went on the caddy and I worked in uh, the bag room at Salem. And then I worked as an assistant at a number of different clubs. And, you know, I, I, I've been in the business forever. You've got to have a real passion for it. Don't you, Scott? I mean, you, you find a bug for it and you find any way to, to get out there to play it. You find any way to get into the, into the industry of it. Um, so yeah, everybody I, I find that, that gets into this industry has, either some sibling or somebody, an older mentor that gets them into the game and they really get a big bug for it. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's, I call it, it's in your blood. Mm -hmm. If you love the game and you want to be in the industry, you find a way to get in the industry. It's either as a golf professional or it's as a sales rep. If you love it and are passionate about it, which, and you can see it in people when they're into it and love the industry and, they're they they're engaged they're engaged right. that's mm -hmm. the word i use yeah. all the time yeah we're it's funny we're at a private club here and i was telling my staff i said we're not in customer service we're in hospitality any any club pro who tells you they're not they're in customer service they're not doing it right because we're in hospitality this is mm -hmm. this is about anticipating people's wants and needs before yeah. they know they want them or need them yes that's what it that's what hospitality is Correct, correct, and and the experience that those those members or, or people have when they come to your to your facility, correct? Correct. That's what we provide. Yeah, gotcha. we want it to be an experience when you come here, either as a member on a regular basis or as a guest. It should be a special opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So kind of like that that Disney. I always come back to the Disney idea. You know, when you go there, it's it's like it, it's your home away from home. Um, you know, and everybody's kind of there to greet you and say hello and. I think that's uh, kind of like the feeling I get when I get to Augusta or something like that, you know? So, yeah. Yep. You ever, you ever seen a negative uh, Disney employee? I don't think there's too many working there. 
right? Yeah, they're they're gone in a hurry. They're they're back in the cast room or wherever they call that. They're um, smiling, yeah, exactly. They're you know. smiling and, and like Scott said, just anticipating needs. So it doesn't matter if it's public, semi-private, you know, p- uh, private. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the people are here for the four to five hours, and they're trying to get a, either get away from their life for four to five hours. Yeah, partially, right? They're trying to work on their own game. They, some reasons people play golf because they weren't good at team sports. So that would be me. Yeah. Um, you know, like I wanted all the glory and all the fame, and I also wanted all the negatives. And uh, I knew if I needed to go practice, it was just me. You didn't need to grab, you know, five or six others to play basketball or play baseball. But it's also a social hub, too, for a lot of people, too, as well. You know, it's it's definitely a home away from home, you know, instead of sitting around the house and, and futzing about, they're out there with their friends engaging with the, uh, you know, the club pro or the employees there or even the maintenance staff. Um, they just find it as a home, you know, I always find, at least in that industry. I'll give you a quick story. This mm-hmm. goes back a long time. My first year in the business, it's an August day. I'm working outside, running the cart barn, and... Uh, the car runs about 70 yards away at Tedesco Country Club. Well, I'm the only one working. It's really busy, and it's about 102 degrees. <laughs> so I'm running back and forth, pulling carts, getting people ready. And a member, uh, Keating, Greg Keating, comes around the corner. I forget his first name. I think it's Greg. Comes around the corner, and he says to me, how you doing today? And I said, oh, I'm doing pretty good, Mr. Keating. How are you? He says, I'm, the, I'm such a hot day. You're doing okay? Little do I know, my boss who I've been working for for four months is standing in the doorway listening to the interaction. Mm-hmm. And I said, if you really want to know, Mr. Keene, my day sucks. I go, it's 104 degrees. I'm the only one working. I'm sweating my ass off and it's busy. And we're going back and forth. And I put his clubs on a cart. And he goes out to play. And the, the golf professional, still one of my closest friends in the business, is mm-hmm. Bob Green, calls me in his office. He says, close the door. I'm thinking, huh? I've been here four months. He's never closed the door. I walked in, closed the door. He says, what did you say to Keating? And I said, you know, he asked me how my day was going. I told him. He said, what did you tell him exactly? I said, well, my day kind of sucks. He says, I don't care. They don't care. The minute you close your door in the parking lot, I don't care if your cat died, you had a fight with your girlfriend, you put a smile on your face, and you come to work. That lesson is 36 years old. I tell that story. 10 times a year, my staff can recite it back to me because it was so invaluable to me in my career. I've never forgotten it. Yep. And it is the basis of my my professional career. T-Mac, the funny part of the story is that um, he told us that speech mm-hmm. literally the day before my cat died. <laughs> like, like my cat died the day before I started working here and, and on a Tuesday in March. And he tells the story and he's, he's like, oh, Oh, sh- sorry, Sean. I, I, it's just always part of the speech. It oh. is, but it is. Well, I'm sorry Anyways. to hear that your cat died. I didn't even know yeah, about that. So. Exactly. Yeah, we'll have the therapy session later. Okay. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, with the, with such a rich history there at Oakley Country Club, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of looking through the history here, Scott. I mean, you've got people like, uh, you know, uh, the Roosevelts have played there. Bobby Jones played there. I mean... Can you can you touch a little bit on the the history of that that course that you've been at for so many years? Twenty one years, I think it is now. It's actually year twenty five for me. Twenty five. Okay, sorry. The most famous part about this, Tim, is uh, it's Donald Ross's original golf course. He came over from Scotland in eighteen ninety nine, walked from where where he sailed to in downtown Boston, walked out here four miles, had nothing to his name became the green superintendent and then went on for, from here. He worked here for 11 years as the club pro and the superintendent. And then he went on to his career after that. Wow. Most by far the most famous uh, person we've had here. We've had a ton of famous players. We've had a ton of famous women. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Curtis mm-hmm. have played here. These are big names in the Massachusetts golf history. Um, oh, Mike O'Haney and, uh, Fred Wright Jr. won the state amateur seven times, I believe. We've had a rich history here, both men's and women's golf. It's really, it's a, it's a staple in the New England area for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, you just look at the history that you know, because I'm looking at the the website that you guys have, which is a great website if anybody gets a chance to take a look at it. But the just the the history through time, the 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 you know everything that comes through is is absolutely amazing. So I mean. 
uh, it, it's just got to be great to, you know, it, it's got to be a joy to go to something that's just so rich with history and, and, and knowing that you're contributing to that history as you go through the halls. Yeah, it's, I'm pretty proud of it. I'm, I'm fortunate to work for such a great membership for such a long period of time. In this day and age, as you both know, that it's hard to be a club pro at one club for a more than 8, 10, 12 years. I'm, yeah. I'm a bit of a dinosaur at this point, mm-hmm. uh, having been here for 25 years. Again, I work for a great membership, so it's really not very difficult to keep them happy. But it's cool, team, Mac. They honor their uh, history, meaning like currently we're we're taking uh, applications for the Fred Wright Golf Tournament that's coming up, right? Uh, that's a two, uh, three-day memory guess, right? Um, we just got done with Donahue Cup qualifying, which is named after a pro who was here for 34 years, Paul Donahue. Paul Donahue. Yeah. Uh, later in the summer, we're going to have uh, the Johnson the Johnson Cup golf tournament. Johnson Cup. Johnson Cup, yes. Johnson Cup, and that's named after Scott Johnson that uh, two years ago? When did no, they start that? Eight years eight ago. Eight years now. ago. Oh, and, wow. Uh, pretty cool. Congratulations. Yeah, that that's, that's pretty stout stuff right there. <laughs> it's pretty odd, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I owe it to a gentleman named John Coughlin and another one named Fred DeVito who uh, wanted to run another what we call plaque tournament, which this is an individual quota event that runs throughout the year, mm-hmm. and he, he my boss at the time was Coughlin, and he said, hey, Scott, you're here. we're going to unveil this plaque. Can you hold it? And I said, sure, and I'm holding the plaque, and it's got a tablecloth over it. And my staff at the time happened to be there, unbeknownst to them and me. Uh, he says, okay, we've got the individual quota tournament. Scott, why don't you unveil that? And I looked down, and it says Johnson Cup on it. And I went, I looked at my boss, and I said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and my staff, my staff is in the corner, Tim, and they are laughing because – my job is to provide a service to the membership, and mm-hmm. I call I call it fly under the radar. I don't like the spotlight; it's not my personality. And to name a tournament after me was a little bit bold. I'm, you know, I I cringe most of the time. I'm like, you could have named it after a number of different people who've been here for a long period of time. It is a tremendous honor. Yeah, it's an absolute tremendous honor, and that's a tremendous amount of respect from my membership for me, and I truly appreciate it. Yeah, but it's it's a big it's a big award or not a big, it's a big tournament. And, you know, uh, I, I'm just kind of trying to stay out of the way and do my job. Gotcha. That's, that's, that's great. So congratulations there, Scott. That's, that's great. Thank so, you. That's Some good. of the stuff we talk about TMAC too is like, um, you know, again, kind of history, some of the things that are done different in Oakley. So I'm going to let t- Scott touch on this, but the mm-hmm. caddy program yeah. at, at Oakley club kind of like, you know, above and beyond what, what, and, and I think, Two things, as I see it from the outsider, now starting to become the insider. The members are gracious with their uh, sort of uh, acceptance, we'll call it, and time and, and uh, willingness to realize that we've got these 12 to 16-year-old kids, mm-hmm. and there might be 30 of them on the bench team out on a Saturday morning, literally on the bench. Like, just picture Caddyshack yeah. uh, audience. It's the <laughs> same thing. Right? There's not a caddy master, right? There's no Bill Murray going around there uh, trying to fight the groundhog. Pat does a good job with that, right? Our superintendent, but um, but it is it's a caddy, a caddy principal, a caddy program, and mm-hmm. uh, Scott's just he's been a like a, a beacon in the in the industry on this program, and he accepted the We Met Scholarship um, yeah. Pro of the Year in 2019. I did, yeah. So go ahead and talk about that, Scott, a little bit. Yeah, please. Um, our program's been running for 25 years. I grew up as a caddy at Salem Country Club, and I was the small kid. Mm-hmm. That always went out last because I was short and had trouble carrying bags, or they thought I did. And then I worked my way up into the caddy ranks, and it is the best way to learn the game for most kids. So when I became the head professional here, we had a limited caddy program, and we've increased it uh, every year. We uh, we promote it. We train them over school vacation for eight hours of training, and then they get the opportunity to go out and caddy. Now, do we have all success stories? No. If we train 35 kids, if we get a dozen that are really good caddies, Mm -hmm. that's a productive year. If you hit on 30%, we're doing well. We've done that. And one of the big carrots at the end, and these are kids, remember, 12 to 15, 16 years old, they don't understand this part. In Massachusetts, we have the We Met Scholarship Fund, and it is – it. provide scholarships to caddies who caddy for two years 
or work on the ground staff for two years, mm -hmm. they're eligible to get that based on need. Last year, the WeMet gave out over $3 million to over, I think it's 300 kids. I mean, it's it's an amazing number. Wow. The scholarships used to range between two and five a year. Now they range between four and 15 a year based on need. And it's every year, unlike some scholarship funds where you, you get it for one year and it goes away. This one is if you get it, your whatever year you get it, every year, every year thereafter until you graduate college, I'm sorry, it's four years. In, in the four years, you get it, and it goes up every year. Oh, that's amazing. It's a big, yeah, it, I, you probably have heard of the Evans Scholarship out in the middle of the country. and mm -hmm. uh, Similar to that, only this one, Evans, is a they do it for smaller numbers. This one hits a lot of kids. It's an outstanding program. The, the membership, by the way, also embrace it by donating money. Right. What's the number there? A hundred grand that Oakley gives? Oakley gives about fifty thousand dollars annually wow. to the WeMet Scholarship Fund. Wow. wow. So um, yeah. over the twenty five years here, the club has been fortunate. Yes, they've given over a million dollars wow. and they've been we've been fortunate to have probably slightly over a hundred WeMet scholars, which is one of the things I'm most proud of, not only for me, I love I, I appreciated the WeMet award. But this is an award that's club-wide, meaning my membership contributes to it, and then my caddies participate in getting it. It's a really big deal, and I'm. It's one of the mo things I'm most proud of about being a part of the Oakland Country Club family. Yeah, I mean that's that's tremendous support that you're getting from your membership. Uh, that's amazing, right there. The the numbers that they're putting out. So. Um, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask is how does the support of the membership there uh, contribute to the uh, scholarship program? But uh, uh, that answered it right there for everybody. That's amazing what they're able to contribute yeah. to your cause and, and what they're able to do. That's amazing. It is. Yeah, it's great stuff. And it's just, again, something that separates, you know, we talk about hospitality versus customer service. That's like a, something mm -hmm. that separates, you know, Oakley Country Club from another golf course in the area. And there's a lot of great golf courses. People have choices. Mm -hmm. uh, but people want to join this country club for a reason, you know, and that's, that's one of them, honestly. Um, so th it's been great to kind of see it in action and uh, the staff, not myself yet, but the other staff member, Scott, the other Scott and uh, Darren do, do just such a good job of getting the, getting the kids out. Whether we have a tournament last Friday, we had a tournament member guest. Mm -hmm. We got the kids out. Sometimes they're four caddies T Mac, which kind of goes, Kind of like the uh, you know unsung hero type of thing. You don't always have to caddy. Yeah. The four caddy program is just you know equally another way to keep, teach the kids, which a lot of people in the audience may not know what that is. But essentially, you're just having the the kid go out, boys or girls, by the way. There's mm -hmm. been plenty of girls that won this scholarship too, right? Um, you know, you're going out in the middle of the fairway, and what I hear from the membership when that happens, yeah. oh my gosh, we should have this all the time because we find the golf balls. Yeah. you know well, and it, it like, keeps the kid engaged it lets them yeah. see the course you know they might not you know not every every person not that comes a on a golf course has the skill or ability but they have the love for it so find a position and, and a spot for them and, and yeah i think that's a great way for for somebody that might just be beginning the game to, to start out it's funny Makes many of the, many yeah they make real money <laughs> too. it's really too. good oh. especially for a 12, 13 14 year old making yeah. Yeah. You know, a hundred bucks in a day. It's like, okay, that's a pretty good wage. Yeah. Um, many of those kids from my caddy program will go on to work in my bag room and they'll work, they'll work for me all through high school into college. I've, I've been incredibly fortunate. I've had some guys work for me for eight or nine years, all through high school, all through college. One of them is named Chris McGuire. He worked for me for nine years mm. and now is back. He's a full member. So I'm getting to see some of these kids go through the program and come back as members now, which is pretty, pretty, it's outstanding is what it is. Wow. Wow. Um, can you, can you, um, you know, are there any significant impacts on any students lives that you've kind of seen with this program, uh, you know, with that gentleman, I mean, but have you seen something where it kind of like, you know, turn, turn the kid around a little bit, big, big changes for somebody or anybody like that maybe? I don't know if I've seen like Maybe underprivileged kids. Yeah, I don't, sure. yeah, I don't okay. know if I could name anybody specifically that yeah. way. Um, I can tell you it's funny to watch. I, oh boy, kid named Max, never been on a golf course in his life yeah. ever. And he want, came through caddy program when he was 14 years old and he wanted to go to NYU. Okay. So this kid caddy, AM and PM, he'd caddy in the morning 
And in the start, obviously, he was carrying singles. And by August of that year, his first year, he was carrying doubles. He would carry doubles in the morning, and then he would carry singles in the afternoon. Uh, wow. So he was doing this every Saturday and Sunday. This wow. kid, in his first year, made like $5,000 towards his education. I love when a caddy has a goal. Yeah. I want a new set of clubs. I want to go to college. I want to buy uh, new bikes or whatever they want because they're motivated. And, again, this goes back to something Sean said earlier. It's about engagement. And if you can get either, you know, my, my staff engaged with the membership or I can get my kids, my caddy program engaged with the membership, they and they're motivated. I want those guys. I want yeah. – that's who I want on my staff. And you – you know a kid who's who's motivated. He's here all the time. Mm-hmm. We caddy on Friday afternoon, Saturday, and Sunday mornings, and the kids who are on the bench on a regular basis, they they want to get better and they want to do a good job, and they do. And the better job they do, obviously, the more money these kids make. Uh, they make real money. It's pretty impressive. That's membership, cool. membership is ridiculously generous to the program. So in, in Silverado world, which I know is a little bit micro, like it's a Silverado Golf and Country Club in Zephyr Hills, mm-hmm. T Mac when I were there, if we had a program like like that for Zeke Kinsman, yeah, or for Nora, remember like Nora, the eleven year old phenom, mm-hmm. right? She ended up going to Augusta, right? So she yeah, qualified. Yeah, drive chip and putt. Yeah. Right. So if we had a program kind of like that for those types of kids in that area, especially I'm going to say the word a little more on the underprivileged side. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's where, you know, you see some of the inner city workings, how it works, uh, in some of the programs, maybe at more like, a um, what's the, uh, Cleveland, municipal, Cleveland uh, Heights or something like that. Yeah. Cleveland Heights and Lakeland, right. Yeah. That, that type of thing. Or, uh, Rogers Park. The, uh, Rogers Park would be a good one. Yeah. Rogers Park would be a great oh, one. I, <laughs> I spent some time there in my, <laughs> just say, yeah. I spent three years of college career at Rogers let's, Park. Let's, yeah. So let's let's move into his playing career that he's very excited and humble to talk about. Hates talking about it. But bottom line, Scott, hey, how many times were you All-American at University of Tampa, Scott? Yeah, love to hear it. I was a two-time, <laughs> two-time All-American and, and a honorable mention All-American once. And the team won two national championships back-to-back in 87 and 88. Yeah. Um, I played with some great players, guys who went on to play on tour, guys who were – just won the national mid am we it was a program that was spectacular wow i call it the fab five t-mac and to me it was that confluence of just five guys from all over different parts of the country mm-hmm. going to a division two school that really wasn't known for golf specifically um but it, that's yeah. it was it was pure luck that we all got together and again here's that we're going to go back to engagement you couldn't have found and it wasn't just we had five guys who played on a regular we had 11 or 12 guys that were pushing each other. Engaged, yeah. yeah. It was who, who's going to get better faster. And and it wasn't cutthroat or, at all, but it was challenging. And I got to play with – I got to play with Jeff Leonard, who played on tour for three years. And Jeff Leonard in 1988 was the number two player in the country, stroke average, behind Bob Estes from – you, uh, you, Texas. Yeah. This kid was the best player in the country. It was amazing. This kid could do it all. And he came out of Indianapolis, went to Tampa to play golf, uh, play baseball, messed up an elbow, and then he had played a little golf in high school and then went on to become basically the best player in the country those last couple of years. It was wow. pretty amazing. Wow. Amazing. That is amazing we've, right there. We've talked about him a few times on the, uh, on the podcast already, right? Well, well, him we saw him swing it out there in or, in Orlando, didn't we? Wasn't right, he? Wasn't right, he? Right. Yeah, I mean, very yeah. unassuming. You know, you wouldn't think, you know, definitely white man can't jump kind of guy. You're like, ah, I'm going to get this guy, and boy, he will eat you for lunch. You can tell. Uh, grew up in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Great family, very unassuming, and will and won't tell you he's going to kill you. We we played in. I played with Lee Jansen and Rocco, and they were a little more. And Hugh Royer up at. Uh, Columbus College, they were more in your face. They were really good players, mm-hmm. and Jeff was at least as good, if not better, than those guys. Jeff would never say a word about himself. The other guys were like, it was an advertisement. Hey, look at me, and I love Jeff for that. Uh, still one of my, still a close friend of mine. Uh, just a tremendous person and a uh, tremendous player. Did you play with better person? Did you play with Kraft too, Greg Kraft. Yeah, I played with Greg Kraft for a season. My freshman, team, right? yeah, yeah, Greg Kraft's 
she, a PGA guy. He played on tour for 21 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kraft's name was Cheese Whiz because of Kraft, obviously. <laughs> okay. Kraft was, Kraft was an amazing player, at, but a guy who uh, humble was not in his vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And I don't really, yeah, sorry, Greg, but that's who you are. <laughs> and you probably still are today. I don't know if he's listening yet to our podcast. Yeah, we're so okay. probably getting onto it. Um, so, so, so from college, then you did you try any mini tour? Try for a couple of years? What did you do? Or you yeah. tried for the year pretty yeah. much after '88. Okay. I came out. I played all the New, New England stuff. Uh, Jeff Schroeder and I, my college teammate, yeah. we traveled together all summer. Played all the opens. I did fairly well. Yeah. Okay. I finished in the top ten. You know, I never won anything big, yeah. but I finished. I was. A, pretty good player. Then I went back to Florida. And I said I was going to go play for the year. And I ran into Jeff Gallagher the third at Disney. And we played, we were paired the first two rounds together in a mini tour event. And I played pretty good. I shot 71, 69 and he shot 65, 64. He oh. hit it further than I did. He hit it more in the middle of middle of the fairway than I did. He hit, hit it closer than I did. He punted it better than I did. And he had sponsorship money. I said, okay, all right. And this is just one guy. I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to do this? And that was uh, up through May. And then I had had my name out up here in Massachusetts on the New England PGA board for a job. Mm-hmm. And of the blue on June 1st, the guy at Tedesco Country Club, Bob Green, the one I shared that story about parking your car and putting on a happy face, uh, called and said, hey, I need somebody. And I lived in the town next door and I went to work for him. I only worked for Bobby for one season before I went down to uh, Milton to go to Wallison Golf Club. And uh, it, it put me in the business. And I realized at that point I could play locally at a pretty high level and did for a long time. And But I wasn't going to play on TV. It just, A, I didn't hit it far enough. And B, I didn't have the sponsorship behind me to do it. So for me, uh, it was an opportunity that I I jumped on and – here I am today. Wow. So, wow. Pretty, pretty impressive resume right there, mm-hmm. T-Mac. So talk, talk to the listeners, Scott, a little bit about your Wallaston, your U.S. Juniors experience. I think that's a good one for the listeners to hear. Yeah. Uh, 1992, I'm down at Wallaston Golf Club in Milton, and they're, we're holding the U.S. Junior, and it's Tiger's second year. So he won in – he was 15 years old, and he won at Lake Merced, I think. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then we were hosting in 92 and we're out there and he comes down to play and 16 year old tiger, by the way. Yeah. Right. Skinny as a stick. Right. Yeah. Uh, all decked out and all Nike stuff. And he gets to know me a little bit because the other assistant who was working at the time had to go in for emergency hip surgery. So he was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't around much. And I had myself and a guy named Dana Smith and we would, we kind of would, we were there to run the event and tiger found me one early on in the week and said, Hey, can I get down to the range? And I would take him down. Walston had two ends of the range. He liked to hit at the far end of the range where there were less people. So I would bring him down and I, I'll never forget. We're driving. It's about a half a mile to the far end of the range. We're driving down. He's got a sports psychologist on the back of the car. We're driving down. I looked at him and said, what's it, what's it like to be you? And he turned and said, everybody wants a piece of me. Everybody wants to touch me. And I said, oh. And now right there I knew that I just I just wanted to leave him alone. And I would bring down the other end of the range, and I'm standing there one day. I said, Tiger, do you care if I watch you hit balls? He goes, no. So I stood off to the side, and I got to, hit, I got to see Tiger Woods hit balls for 30 straight minutes, me, him, and his caddy. That's it. And it was, uh, it was different. Even then you knew it was different. It sounded different when he hit it. And then he went out, we're, then he goes on to play, and he is, prior to the final round, he gets in the final round, I think he's playing Marco Wilson, and we're getting ready to go off to, he's getting ready to go off to the first tee, and the other assistant, Mike Bemis, is the kid with the bad hip, is banged up, he's in the shop. Mm-hmm. And I said to Tiger, I said, could you do me a favor and uh, meet my other assistant, meet the other assistant. So he came in, and as we were walking in, this is when we had metal spikes, we had a tile floor. Tiger almost takes a Dixie. He has to grab onto the bag rack so he doesn't fall down. I'm thinking, I'm going to wreck this kid's back before we even get to play. Wow. So 
he came over and he met Mike Demas and he couldn't have been more of a gentleman. He said, Hey, Michael, I'm glad you're here. I hope you get to see some of the final match. I hope to see you on the golf course. He was great. Now, whether you love Tiger or you don't. I'm a big he, Tiger he, fan. He, was, he yeah. was terrific. He yeah. was terrific. So we go and we're watching the match. And we're on the 16th hole at Wollaston, which is a par five. He is now two down with three to go. So pins in the back, right? I'm with Tom Meeks with the time he's running the USGA. We're in the cart together. And we're out in the fairway and Tiger hits it in the pin to his back right. And he hits it on the back fringe. And he spins it back through the fringe to about four feet. He makes it for four. Wins all. Now he's one down with two to go. Okay. The next hole is really difficult. Par three. He makes three. Wilson makes four. We go to 18. We're even. Mark Wilson throws up on himself, makes six. Tiger makes bogey oh, and wins. Okay. And that's how he won his second U.S. junior down at Wallston. It was uh, it was pretty phenomenal. That's amazing. But you'd, you'd heard of this kid, and then to see it in in person is it was outstanding even then. And now you know you look where he is now. Did you did yeah. you did you have a good sense? I mean, you had a sense when you watched him then that he would he was going to have the career that he was going to have, or did you think it might've been a little hyped up a little bit? Or did you say this kid's the real deal and I'm going to see him crush some records? You knew he, he was the real deal when you watched him hit it, when you heard him hit it. So he, this kid's 16 years old and the sound it made at 16 was different than anything pretty much I'd ever heard from any player, whether they were adult or a child, he hit it flush almost every swing, single swing which is pretty amazing because later on when he was a Titleist guy, he went down, I can remember this, he went down to Manchester Lane and they said early in his career, he hit it, he swung the fastest and he hit it most in the center of any tour pro they'd ever tested. Well, at that point, I, even before that, when we saw him down there, you knew how good he was. Uh, you knew how amazing he was. And then to hear that stat afterwards about uh, him down at Titleist and how centered he hit it and how, no wonder he was good. As long as he could putt it, which clearly he can, mm-hmm. he was going to do something special. And he was. Yeah. He was. That's amazing. That's amazing right yeah. there. Cool. That was a pretty good story right there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I, I was captivated. I'm sitting here all quiet. So. <laughs> exactly. So, Scott, you've got, as we kind of conveniently just talk, you've got four course records that you can remember. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's got one up here, T-Mac. He's got 62. There's two other players who've had 62 at, well, at uh, Oakley. Jeff Bailey, yeah. uh, previous pro, and Paul Donahue both shot 62 here at Oakley. Yeah, that's that's eight under wow. for the record. Wow. Um, so my question is. What was, time it was nine. Was it nine under? Oh, okay, my bad. Sorry. Oh, my I mean, that's, that's kind of a stroke there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my, my question to you is, because my low is 64. I've done it a couple times in my life. T-Mac, you've had some low rounds, like – Scott, to you, when you get to that zone, when you're in those areas of like that five, six under, and now I'll arguably for us now at our age, it might be two, three under. <laughs> yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Like yes, the, kind of the, the bars change a little bit, but, but like what, how do you get there? Sort of how do you stay there? Maybe for the listener, sort of the guy who's trying to break 90, right? The, the lady who's trying to break a hundred, whatever that is. What's that sort of thing that you can kind of give them? You always hear stay in the present. Those that's, kinds of things, like that's, yeah. don't think ahead, whatever. It's a lovely catchphrase. It's really <laughs> difficult to do. Uh, think about what's in front of you and don't count how many players we have that are out here and they know they're playing pretty well. So they're on 16 and they add up the scorecard. They're like, well, if I make three pars, I'm going to shoot 75. or I'm going to shoot 85 and I'm going to break 90 for the first time. They're toast at that point. Once your brain gets involved, now mm. your brain's involved when you're playing golf, obviously. Try to play each hole independently and put down the scores in the box and then add them up after 18. Don't add them up after nine if you do it. I did this. I was a score guy. I'd add it up when I was younger. Um, Five years ago, my daughter got sick big time. And I was playing golf at that point was more respite. Yeah, Yeah, therapy. So I, I went out and I started to play some big events up here and, I finished second on our section championship at Myopia and Tedesco, and I played very well. And the key to this one was I stopped I stopped adding up scores at that point because I really didn't care whether I made a three-footer or missed a three-footer. My daughter was in real jeopardy. I didn't. It didn't matter as much. So the phrase, care less and play better golf, is really a true statement where it 
The only one who really cares about how well you play is you personally. Yeah. Because the guy you're playing with is trying to beat you, and the other two guys are trying to play against you. It's all, Golf is, as Sean said, it's an individual sport. Yeah. That's another reason I, I reached out to it, too. I was a baseball player and a hockey player, and I didn't want somebody to make a mistake and cost us a game. Here, you make a mistake in golf, it's all on you. I like that part of the game. I like that I can practice on my own. But to keep to stay in the present is to just look forward and hit the next shot and not worry about the result and not worry about not worry about the score. Just play the next shot and don't add up your score. If I could teach my membership, just put the numbers in the boxes, add them up at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. The second round of that section championship was at Tedesco Country Club. And I'm playing with a guy named Jeff Stewart. The other guy bailed out, so it's just the two of us, so it's a little slow. We play. I think I'm playing okay. I haven't just written down the boxes, and I go in and I hand the scorecard to I, my numbers are correct. I still haven't had the totals. I hand it to the guy behind the computer. He keys it in. He looks up at me and says, great round, 69. I said, okay. And I didn't know that I had shot 69, but that was the mentality I need to have when I play golf, and I wish more of us did that. Well, you don't count. And if you don't count, you're not going to worry about the score as much. But people, we are score driven. Yeah. You know, what you should, what you make on that hole. And, uh, oh, you know, I love the guy, Tim. My favorite is the guy. He's your buddy. Mm-hmm. And Sean's playing with me. We're buddies. And I, pl- I play great on the front. I shoot four under. And he can't wait to tell me on the 10th tee, hey, you know, you're four under? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, is, there is a really good story out here about me. I shoot. 20, a 29 on the front one day playing with three members. 10 at the time was a par five. It's now a par four. But at the time, I make four. So I'm a, I'm eight under after 10. And the member walked into the 11th tee says, you know, you're going to break the course record today. <laughs> I finished, I had three bogeys coming in and the end of that show. Yeah. But in that what it does is it takes you out of just playing golf and now you're thinking about score and all that stuff. Correct. It's totally different. You really need to not think about score and just hit the shot in front of you. And that's all you can do. Well, it, it kind of like going back to the idea of if somebody's throwing a no hitter, you don't go down to the pitcher and say, Hey, by the way, you just need to three more uh, outs and you get this no hitter. I mean, nobody does that. Right. So, I mean, I think you just, when somebody's in the zone, at least when I see somebody in the zone like that, I'm just, I'm trying to play, out of their way and be quiet. If that 100%. Makes sense. Yeah. We played here. We do a pro member every few years and I had my buddies come in and we're playing and one of the guys I'm playing with, you guys did, did a podcast with Jerry York. His mm-hmm. brother, Billy's playing with me. Well, Billy never broke an 80 and he's in my group. And right now we got two par threes, 14 and 15 to finish. And he's going to, all he's going to do is go bogey, bogey to finish. Mm-hmm. And he's going to shoot 78. So I know this because I'm sitting in the cart with one of my guys. And one of my guys, the cart guy I'm riding with says, hey, should we tell him? I go, if you tell him, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he went on. He made 4-3, and he shot 78, I think it was. And it was the first time he'd ever broken 80, and it was during an event. So it, was, oh, it wasn't wow. like they were gimmies. These were like real thoughts. I was like, it was phenomenal. But when you're in that zone, if somebody tells you, talks about it, how about when you make three birdies in a row? Hey, you know, you made three birdies in a row, yeah. you know. No, I didn't know that. You know, I mean, come on, I'm paying attention here. Well, you know, you're going to make another one? Uh, I have no idea. I'm just going to go play golf and yeah. just hit the next one. But we get too caught up in numbers and we get, you know, just play the game. Play the next shot. Play the next hole. Right, right. And I think you also see that with, you know, just kind of turning over to lessons. You know, sometimes when I see lessons, I, I try to tell them, hey, we got to go through a process here. But they get so result driven you know i think you know with numbers and results that people want we live in that world of instant gratification we want to see something you know low we want to see something you know go straight uh you know they just don't take the time to to make a make a process of it i think that one drives me a little bananas as a teacher Mm -hmm. the quick fix guy tim the guy who comes in says uh you know my game's a mess fix me huh wait a minute but well your grip's terrible your posture's bad your back swings out of place and you make a decent follow through. Okay. Well, can you fix them all at once? No, I can't. <laughs> I can't. And it's hard. We start, you know, we do, a, we do a fair amount of teaching and mm-hmm. you can't overwhelm people. If you give them too much stuff, yeah. you, you get them lost. And then they are like, I, my game stinks. You got to keep it simple. Yeah. Keep it simple. But it's pretty, 
you know, let's keep it basic. There's, you know, fundamentals in golf swings that everybody has. You better have a good grip, yeah. better have a good posture, good backswing to set up a good downswing. They, that's that's pretty much a teaching philosophy. You know Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Those those fundamentals okay. need to hold. I got I got two things to add to that, T Mac and, and listeners. So my first story is um, my dad passed away in two thousand seven. Uh, greatest guy in my life. Scott's known him since he was a kid. Came over for breakfast, and he, <laughs> he, he just knew my dad. And that's part of the legacy between the two of us, which was great. So I'm at Green Valley Country Club in 2008, the first Father's Day after my dad passed. Mm -hmm. I shoot 36 in the front, ho-hum, life is great, things are good. I go eagle, birdie, eagle, birdie, birdie on the next five holes. Wow. Seven under. Member on number 15 tee box says to me, hey, you know you're seven under? I'm like, yeah, I do. I wish you hadn't said anything to me. And I wheel it in for seven under on the back nine and shoot whatever the number was, 64 or whatever. But it was uh, it was just kind of a funny, like, as I hear Scott tell the story, we all have those, like, the birdie thing is great. Like, mm -hmm. just the reason, hey, you almost want to say to the 15 handicap guy, like, look, the reason I'm here is because I'm, I already know all this. Like, don't, you don't need to add to that, but you know. Correct. Um, so then the other part of that story is my brother, I, I like this concept when he teaches especially beginners mm -hmm. he'll go do a playing lesson and on the scorecard all he's writing down is how many good shots that person's hit in a hole okay. period but four just hey you're on a par five and you hit two good shots he writes down two that's a really good way to approach especially as you're trying to break these barriers of 100 mm -hmm. 95 90 80 like Forget that number. I I hate par on a scorecard because it's for one percent of the population. Yeah, correct. That's the problem. Correct. I mean, as, as golf professionals, and I don't ever think this way, but one of my assistants, Scott, said, "You know, we're in the top one percent of the golfers in the world because mm -hmm. we can break we can break eighty on a regular basis, but we can also break seventy here and there." Yeah. And most people, I mean, they look they marvel at us yeah. and think, and the only reason we got here. And we were as good as we are is because we put the time in. Yes. I wish people would put more time in. The yeah. game is the game gives you, you not immediately, it. it may take a little while, but it will give back to you if you put the effort in. And people in this world, instant gratification, mm -hmm. I want it now. They're not, they don't put in enough work. Yeah. 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 So. I definitely hey, agree can, with that. As you can tell, T Mac, we probably need to schedule a part two with Scott because he's got a ton of information in his head. He does. He does. Um, you know, a lot of a wealth of knowledge right there. A lot of history uh, to go yep, through. Yeah. Um, you know, just an amazing stories of Tiger and, and everybody like that. Um, you know, yeah, I think we need to schedule up part two, maybe next week or in a week or so, or something like that. Uh, this this was enjoyable. I enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Scott. Thanks very much, Tim. I really yeah. enjoyed it. All we did was we touched on Donald Ross, Tiger Woods, and Coach Jerry York. We're doing pretty good today, Team Mac. Right, and and I think we fixed a few people's swings with uh, some mental <laughs> imagery and, and trying to stay in the zone. And if your buddy's uh, in the zone, don't make a lot of yeah, noise. Leave Just be alone. quiet. Yeah, leave him alone, man. Yeah. Let him have his oh, nose. That's, That's correct. Exactly. Great, man. Great. So I uh, want to thank uh, Scott for uh, joining us. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks uh, for listening to us here at Dynamic Golf. Um, Sean, any last words before we break? No, I like what you just said. Just, you know, play within yourself, play within your zone, have a good time, keep score when you have to, but otherwise just keep working on your game and, and put into it what you want to get out of it, bottom line. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you, the, the big thing is it takes time to develop these these yeah. movement patterns, and if you don't put them in, you don't get them out. You got to. Last thing I will say because I gave two lessons this morning. You, the reason why you go to get a golf lesson is so you have a plan. Yeah. Period. Right. Right. Like the reason why people they get frustrated. They were fr both my lessons were frustrated this morning out there with me because they're not getting it. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I walk away. They hit one good one, and I say, "Okay, let's go do. Let's go putt instead of chip." But I still don't have chipping down. No, you're not going to get it in this 15 to 20 minute quadrant. No, you're going to get it two weeks from now or a month from now. Yep. You'll get it. Yep. You know. So, so, but you have to go to the PGA professional to get the plan. And YouTube doesn't always work. 
It's not individualized. Correct. Like YouTube is not going to address your issue. <laughs> right, right. That's right. So, uh, if I want to learn how to change an oil filter, I'll go to YouTube. Yeah, or, pretty, or, you know, something like that. But a golf swing, no yeah. Surrey Bobcat. No. So, That's right. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Like, so. Great, great episode, team Mac. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, right. Thank you, all our listeners out there. Um, thank you, and have a good one, and we look forward to you next Friday. Talk to you soon. Thanks, yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you.